Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. A very warm welcome to all of you in this uh, lecture, one of the lectures in the course Development Processes and Social Movements. So in this course you already had 15 lectures and this is your lecture number 16 which I have titled as Caste Movements. So in this chapter first of all we will learn about the notion of caste, what is caste as an institution and then what role does the caste play in the Indian politics and why we need to study about caste uh, movements in India. So I have primarily focused upon the Dalit movements because as such we do not have a chapter on Dalit movements. But I have also dealt with issues like uh, say rise of regional parties which are mostly based on caste etc. So let me first begin with the introduction of this uh, chapter. So, we will study about caste as a social institution which is mainly based on endogamy. Endogamy is that the same caste marriage which is prevalent in India. And uh, if you will look at the matrimonials, the advertisements in the newspapers regarding marriage, then you will see that people mostly prefer uh, the marriage in the same caste. Then similarly even uh, it has its uh, impact on the property. Uh, in India. So, property system because then uh, the same caste getting married into the same caste then the money or you can say property it remains in the same caste. At the same time uh, along with being a social institution caste is an important factor in Indian politics. Then uh, next issue is the issue of untouchability because it was prevalent in India for a very long time and uh, uh, there was this practice of uh, untouchability which uh, led to the Dalit movements. For instance, especially here I would like to mention three things. One was uh, their entry into the temples because they were prohibited from uh, in entering into the temples. Then also the use of public wells, the, the source of drinking water was prohibited for the Dalits. And the third was uh, that they were not allowed to say marry. Uh, into the other caste. So, these were the things due to which the Dalit movements took place and later on we will study about the Dalit movements. So, uh, we, in this chapter we will also study about the role of Phule, Jyotiba Phule, uh, then Periyar and Dr. Ambedkar because these three uh, figures are considered very important in the Dalit movements in India. Then we will study about rise of regional political parties as in how caste plays its role in vote bank politics in India and also the identity based politics in India. Because when we talk about identity then uh, one issue is the uh, religion, another issue is uh, class and along with that the third factor is caste and caste is something which is uh, one of the components of Hindu religion but at the same time it is something which is unique to India as a, an Indian society. Then uh, next I will tell you about anti-reservation protests in 1990s and lastly uh, we will also discuss about the caste class gender debate how these three are interlinked and there are complexities of understanding these three uh, the caste class and gender issue and it has its impact on Indian society as well as Indian polity. So, this is how we are, I have framed this chapter and I thought of introducing uh, first how are we going to do this lesson. So, coming to the next slide let me tell you first of all we will talk about caste as a concept. So, maybe most of you are aware of caste being one of the most prevalent and also it is one of the most debated and discussed issue especially due to its significance in Indian society. So, as I told you earlier also that caste is something which is unique to India 
and caste has its impact on society as well as polity. So, let me tell you how does it impact society. So, be it marriage, be it dining, be it uh, the property uh, thing, uh, how will it be passed to another generation. Due to these things, caste is a very important institution. Similarly, why polity? Because caste plays an important role in a vote bank. So, the vote bank politics is uh, linked with caste in India. So, these were the two things uh, due to which uh, we understand caste as an important factor. Initially, how did caste start? So, caste in the beginning was an organizing principle of society. As in uh, its first mention we find in Manu Smriti, which I have uh, mentioned later on. So, conventionally there were two ways of looking at caste. How did caste become so dominant? One was that conventionally the jobs were based on caste. For instance, if the, the Brahmins are there, then they will be into two things. One, uh, into the profession of teaching that they can become teachers or they will be the priests that uh, they will perform all the ritual rites and other things. Uh, similarly, if there will be Kshatriyas, then they will uh, go to the wars. So, they will be part of the army. So, four dominant castes in India, they were Brahmins, Kshatriya, then third was the Vaishya community. So, Vaishya were the trading community. So, they will be into, they will be the shopkeepers, they will uh, be the ones who will go for trading. And fourth was the Shudra. Shudras were considered as the fourth uh, and, and one of the most. So, uh, in a way kind of untouchability was uh, practiced with them. Later on, so other than this jobs being dependent on caste that there was this caste based job which was prevalent in uh, traditional you can say or in, in, the, uh, in the primary days. Later on uh, what happened is that uh, this notion of reservation came up and reservation is in three sectors and here I am talking about reservation in the post independence India uh, and for that primarily. Uh, it was Dr. Ambedkar who played an important role uh, so that uh, the SCs and STs they got the reservation and it affects them that they get it for education that in educational institutions the seats are reserved for them. Along with that they also get reservation in employment so second sector is employment and third is the political representation. So these are the three sectors in which we get to see reservation. So, due to these two, uh, we um, can understand that caste as an organizing principle of society became very important and because it affected from marriages to jobs everywhere. Then say, uh, third point I have mentioned is the caste and gender. So, there is a relationship between caste and gender and there is a, I have written that changing notion because uh, uh, when we will talk about the women's movement, there also you will study about Dalit feminism. So, there has been a rise of Dalit feminism because the issues related to women. For instance, do women who are Dalit, do they feel more discriminated vis-a-vis -vis the non-Dalit women or uh, the way Ambedkar had his caste movements, could he adequately manage the issues of uh, regarding women? So, these are the issues we need to take into consideration. Then uh, sometimes we, sh uh, we should also remember that the caste is equated with race because as we have the racial discrimination in uh, a country like USA or even in some parts of Africa, similar to that we see that there is caste system in India because caste is also something that leads to discrimination. So, we have to remember this point of social discrimination and thus uh, caste is sometimes seen as a parallel with race. So, uh, caste in India has its roots in Manu Smriti. It was uh, Dr. Ambedkar who publicly burnt this uh, text Manu Smriti uh, during his Mahar Satyagraha in 1927. So, let me quickly uh, write about this Satyagraha, Mahar Satyagraha. You should remember about Mahar Satyagraha in 1927 in Maharashtra. 
Maybe we will come about the details of the, these movements later when we will discuss about the contribution of Dr. Ambedkar. But still here, since I mentioned about he burnt Manusmriti, so I thought let me just mention. Then the last point here that I want to tell you is that this terminology, there are Harijans, then there are Dalits, SCs, STs, OBCs, these are the different terms which are used and they denote different castes in India. So, Harijan was the term which was used by Gandhi and uh, uh, Ambedkar had objection to that term and gradually the term Dalit uh, was started being used. So, uh, there is so much so about even the, uh, the politics of naming. So, how will they be named those who are uh, those who belong to the lower castes. Then this term scheduled castes, SCs this term and the scheduled tribes because this these two terms came in the government of india act 1935 then uh, obcs the other backward uh, castes these are also uh, the terms so you can understand that castes uh, in india are very uh, important category to understand the social realities now coming to caste in indian society why and how it is so deeply entrenched in Indian society. So, it was in 1916 that Ambedkar read a paper, Ambedkar presented a paper in America, uh, in New York basically in one of the conferences and that paper was titled Castes in India, colon, Their Mechanism, Genesis and Development. So, in this paper, if you if you look at the title of the paper, then these are three terms mechanism, genesis and development. So, what Ambedkar was trying to do was that he brought this issue of castes in India to a global arena. So, now in front of all over the world because there in that seminar there were uh, there were scholars from all over the world. So, Ambedkar himself being a Dalit, he tried to pose this issue of caste in India uh, that how problematic this notion of caste is and their mechanism, how does it function, how marriage and dining, everything is affected by caste. Then in terms of genesis, he was looking at Manu Smriti as the key text which carries you can say the roots of uh, castes in India and then development how has it eventually become one of the most dominant kind of practice in India. So, this uh, paper was later published in one of the volumes and then gradually the understanding of castes in India or that why is it problematic it started becoming uh, much more prevalent and more and more number of people started getting aware of this. Then uh, in the recent days, I have mentioned this that in 1979, it was the education department of the government of Maharashtra which published this article because after that 1917, that paper was published in America. But now uh, after you can see around 60 years, more than 60 years, around 62 years that it again came into you know uh, in the public debate or you can say public arena, more and more people started reading Ambedkar's writings and speeches. So, this uh, contribution of education department of government of Maharashtra is something that he made uh, the writings by Ambedkar much more accessible to people. So, now many people were reading about uh, his understanding. Then there is a book called Annihilation of Caste. Uh, that book Ambedkar wrote in 1936 in which he mentions that caste is a social as well as an economic system. So, he wanted to uh, he wanted people to understand that it is not just having its impact on society, but also on economy because it it shapes the economy in a major way. Then he also underlined that it is a harmful institution. Why is it a harmful institution? Because in a way it, uh, it prohibits a certain section of society from getting this education in the same way or uh, to have the similar opportunities for, uh, for getting their jobs. So, that is the reason that he even calls caste as something which is a negative thing. And uh, Ambedkar was of the view that 
till the time there is caste system in India, then democracy can never be so successful in India. Because you can't have a political society based on equality when your society is based on caste system which is based on inequality. So this understanding that caste system is something that promotes inequality was underlined by uh, Ambedkar. So let me tell you about the four essential features of caste system which actually tell us how inequality functions through caste system. So one is the hierarchy. So there is a hierarchy which is promoted by caste system. So the four castes, uh, the, the Brahmins are the highest, then the next is the Kshatriya, then third is the Vaishya and fourth is the Shudra. So this is like, uh, the structure is like this. And here at the top if the Brahmins are there, then the second rung, then third, fourth. Then after Brahmins there will be Kshatriyas, next will be the Vaishyas and then there will be the Shudras. So, as you can see that the Shudras will be the lowest rung of the society, they will be here at the base and the Brahmins will be at the top. So, this is how the society has to be based and this will promote the hierarchy. So, of course, Brahmins will have more control on the knowledge system and other things. Next point is commensurity. So, commensurity is about uh, the another kind of there is again everything in the society will be according to hierarchy. So commensurity is also similar to hierarchy. It promotes a kind of differential treatment. So the these four communities will be treated differently. How will they be treated differently? For example, uh, if uh, a certain kind of crime is done by the Brahmin and the same crime is done by the Shudras, then the Brahmins will get lesser punishment because they are higher caste. So this is the point which is proved by commensurity that uh, higher the caste, lower your punishment kind of thing. Third is the restriction on marriage. So marriage was also something uh, which was promoted that only in the same caste the marriages should take place. And if there is inter-caste marriage, then such marriages are not considered to be good. And uh, here you should also understand that this restrictions on marriage also function in, in a different way for men and women. For instance, men can marry the women of lower castes, but if the women of higher castes will marry the men of lower caste, then it is much more derogatory. And especially the children born out of such inter-caste marriages, their property things become even more complicated that whose property will go to whom. Uh, the father's side of property or say mother's side of property or in most of the cases if, if the inter-caste marriages took place then either male uh, either the male members family or the female uh, females family will just uh, say no to that kind of relationship or they will not be given social recognition so that was also another problem that there were uh, restrictions on marriage similarly there was also restriction on uh, dining uh, if the marriage will take place in say Vaishya community, then they will invite most of the times they will invite their Vaishya community. So that interdining was also not the culture at that time. And fourth point is hereditary uh, occupation that mostly the occupation was caste based that the Brahmins will go for teaching or, uh, or becoming priest or the Vaishyas will be the one who will be uh, in the trader class. Rajputs will go into army. So eventually everything in the occupation system was based on the caste system. So this one gives you in a way the backdrop how did caste function in the Indian society. Now we come to the caste movements because now once you understood that caste system was based on inequality. So in order to fight that or in order to change the society. These caste movements in a way they acted as uh, you can say social reform movements. So these caste movements about which I have mentioned here in this slide, they are in the pre-independence days and they are mostly about different parts of India and they are part of the social reform movements. So on the one hand there were things like say 
ban on child marriage or ban on sati pratha so as there were there was one wing of social reform which was about women empowerment this was another wing of uh, social reforms which addressed the issue of caste reforms because now by now it was recognized that uh, this kind of social inequality promoted by caste is not good for indian society so let us uh, learn about some of the movements there was a movement called nayar movement there is a nayar community in kerala so nayar movement in kerala uh, was one of the first uh, caste movements in india second was the satya shodhak movement this was led by jyotiba phule and savitri bai phule so they established an organization called satya shodhak samaj and the movement that they they led is called the satya shodhak movement as you can see it in the term itself satya shodhak they were stressing on the fact that they are seeking the truth so basically the truth is that god has made all the human beings equal so once god creates all the human beings caste is not something that is created by god himself so jyotiba phule and savitri bai phule played an important role in this uh, caste reform movements in maharashtra then there was this aravi puram uh, movement by narayan guru in kerala so kerala was also a very like caste was dominant as a system there so we had nayar movement we also had aravi puram movement then another movement in tamil nadu was called nadar movement and it it took place in the ramnad district of uh, tamil nadu then uh, the formation of justice party movement took place in 1916 so now we have uh, partly entered into the 20th century so you are aware of this that 20th century had this indian national movement was in in its full swing or it was um, by the time we entered into 20th century we had uh, the indian national congress which was functioning and and a kind of uh, nationalist wave was going on so justice party movement was established by people like dr t m nair p tyagra chetty and c n mudaliar so all these people they formed this south indian liberation federation sil Uh, and they tried to have uh, for the first time they started discussing about this idea of reservation that the lower caste uh, should have reservation uh, then eventually there was a self respect movement this is quite a famous one self respect movement maybe many of you would have heard ev rama swami and we also call him uh, periyar he led this movement self respect movement he also started a journal which is named kudi arasu so kudi arasu journal was started by uh, periyar in the year 1910 but later on he started this movement self respect movement in 1925 ambedkar led two movements one was the depressed classes movement and later uh, uh, in during his mahar satyagraha was also named as mahar movement along with all these gandhi also led a movement which is sometimes called as harijan movement or sometimes people even call it congress harijan movement and an organization was set up called all india anti touchability untouchability league in 1932 and he gandhi established this weekly called harijan so one was kudi arasu journal started by periyar and harijan was the weekly started by gandhi in 1933 so next what i have done is that i have given you one slide on role of phule and periyar and then we will study about contribution of dr ambedkar so as i had told you in the beginning as in the introduction i mentioned that we will focus on these three people phule periyar and ambedkar to understand their role in caste movements the dalit movement in india so first of all to begin with the periyar and phule both of them fought for emancipation of untouchables so that is one thing then what were they opposing they opposed hindutva and caste inequality basically why did they oppose hindutva is because there was this brahmanical tendency because uh, the brahmin caste was so dominant in in the hindu caste uh, system so uh, what all did they do they they established some institutions they did some writings they tried to educate the masses 
so these were the ways how they were trying to raise a kind of uh, you can say political consciousness among the dalits so jyotiba phule wrote books like gulamgiri uh, another book is called achhuton ki kaifiyat then uh, brahmano ki dhurtata so uh, from the uh, terms of uh, from the very titles of the book you can understand that he was trying to uh, make the untouchables uh, aware of their plight so once they will know that they are being discriminated then only they can get united uh, then phule along with his wife savitri bai phule he also established this uh, organization named satya shodhak samaj in 1873 about this i mentioned to you earlier also to educate the girl children and the women periyar demanded for dravid stan he was saying that dravid should get uh, united so now what we call tamil nadu at that time like we were under british rule so within that periyar was of the demand that there should be uh, something like dravid stan for all the dravids he wrote a book called sachi ramayan because he was of the view that the ramayan that we uh, have now is in the favor of the hindus or it is in the favor of the brahmins so sachi ramayan will be something which will be uh, pro lower castes then periyar also established this party called justice party which was later named as dravid munnetra kajgam dmk and you must be aware that dmk party still exists in tamil nadu it is one of the important parties there uh, sometimes the ruling party and sometimes the party in opposition so periyar is someone who worked immensely for uh, the political consciousness of the dalits now coming to contribution of ambedkar so first of all he established uh, as you must be aware that ambedkar had this chance of studying abroad he did he got his degree of phd from usa and i earlier mentioned to you about his paper in which he mentioned about genesis of caste so once he came back to india then he did a series of things and among those some of the things that i would like you to know is that first he established depressed classes institution in 1924 then uh, secondly he also started a marathi fortnightly called bahiskrit bharat uh, that he started in 1927 and here i have missed to mention there is another newspaper also that he started periodical which was called mook nayak so bahiskrit bharat is one second is the mook nayak so you should know about these two magazines started by ambedkar then he also established samaj samta sang samaj samta sang means he wanted to bring equality in the society and this is the reason here i would partly like to mention that ambedkar was very attracted by buddhism in fact in his lifetime he even converted himself to buddhism and and the major reason behind that was that uh, while buddhism was based on equality unlike the hindu system being based on inequality so he also established scheduled caste federation in 1942 so in his lifetime uh, ambedkar established three political parties one was independent labor party ilp he formed this party in 1936 and you should also know that in 1937 independent labor party actually won 14 seats out of 18 seats on which it contested so in the maharashtra state elections it had contested and the, his party won a good number of seats then he also established scheduled caste federation in 1942 about which we mentioned earlier also and the third and the last party was republican party which he established uh, towards the end of his life that was the last party that he sta- he established and this party republican party is in the post independence period so within a span of you can see 20 years while in 1936 he is making independent labor party by 1956 he is establishing republican party and here you can understand that republican party is uh, partly influenced by his love for buddhism because buddhism is also something 
which promotes republicanism so right now we don't have a chance to get into the details of republicanism so i will just move on to the next thing so here i have mentioned some of the important organizations and magazines which played an important role in raising awareness among the lower caste so satya shodhak samaj i have already mentioned i won't speak much about it there was another organization with the same satya shodhak but it was satya shodhak mandal this was established by shahu maharaj in kolhapur in 1912 then harijan sevak sang was established by mahatma gandhi and this harijan sevak sang was not a part of congress because here you should remember that uh, throughout his life the way gandhi was working so certain things were with congress and certain things were outside congress so his this activity of having the harijan sevak sang was outside the congress then bahiskrit bharat was was started as well as muknayak was another uh, journal by ambedkar here i have missed writing one a which is uh, uh, sorry i will just go to here it should be samaj samta sang so samaj samta sang was established in 1927 again by ambedkar only in order to advance the issue of social equality then this uh, scheduled caste federation was established in 1940s by ambedkar so all these organizations played an important role in uh, raising awareness among the lower caste now let's talk about caste reforms during the freedom struggle in one of the recent books this book has come only in 2022 a manoj mitta has written a book called caste pride battles for equality in hindu india so in that he has mentioned about two kinds of leaders he has mentioned that there are some who are the unsung heroes the unsung heroes means we haven't heard much about their contribution or we don't get to know uh, about their uh, role for example he gives example of vithal bhai patel bv narsimha ayer kali charan uh, nandgawali then hari singh gaur mr jaykar etc so these were the unsung heroes means they tried to do a lot many things but they were not part of the dalit community itself that's why uh, we don't get to know much about their role and on the other hand there were those who tried to push back against the caste reforms so for example people like motilal nehru uh, madan mohan malviya sn banerji and as you can see he has even mentioned c raj gopalachari as well as mahatma gandhi to some extent these were the congress leaders and so uh, manoj mitta makes this point that these congress leaders did not do enough for caste reforms so these are the two categories i wanted to mention to you uh, vithal bhai patel did an important thing he had moved the inter caste marriage bill so he was one of the first ones to advocate the inter caste marriage that bill had come in 1918 then another resolution was about the open access to the public places for untouchables and that bill was brought by r srinivasan in 1926 next is the resolution which ad was adopted in 1923 by the bombay legislative council that the untouchables should have access to public places including watering places means the source of water should be open for them this was by sk bole's initiative so these are the points that i wanted to mention that how gradually their access to public places started increasing let's now talk about caste consciousness and political awareness so what ambedkar did was that he gave a call for three things one is self respect self help and self knowledge so he wanted the dalits to understand that nobody can help them unless they are ready to help themselves so what he did is that he gave pledge to 3000 untouchable women to educate their children they told the dalits that education will be the means to empower themselves so uh, they he told the women that if your husbands drink alcohol then you should not feed them and that kind of message when ambedkar was giving to the women 
then he was understanding that if once the women will start educating their children then that will gradually change the condition of their lives and ambedkar preferred to fight in the courts rather than in the streets so ambedkar was of the view that the institutions for example the judiciary can play an important role and uh, as you know that uh, he un he understood that constitution as a document can be very important because that will uh, in a way empower the people and you must be knowing that article 17 of our indian constitution which uh, advocates that there will be nothing like untouchability so that is something which has roots in all these practices so ambedkar had no faith in gandhi and congress ambedkar was of the view that uh, they have not done enough for the dalits so he led numerous temple entry movements in different parts of maharashtra ambedkar was inspired by buddha kabir phule by uh, being inspired by these three he advocated castelessness that there should be no caste system and he tried to promote the culture and practice of inter dining and inter caste marriage in indian society so how was he trying to do that was that he was trying to promote modernity for him modernity is something which is based on three values which are those three values liberty equality and fraternity so liberty will be something that if people will feel themselves free so freedom is the another word for liberty second is equality in order to ensure equality you have to overcome inequality because if caste system is based on inequality then you have to replace that with a system of equality and third is fraternity that the feeling of uh, being brothers so the notion of fraternity is also something once the liberty and equality will come then only you can ensure fraternity so he understood this that the modernity can be one way it can be used as a tool to educate the masses to overcome their inferior attitude so he was of the view that the dalits need to first of all empower themselves they have to understand that the real power lies within so once they will understand that they are empowered beings then only they can assert themselves now here i have talked about typology of dalit movement so there is not just one kind of dalit movements there are numerous kinds of dalit movements so ghanshyam sa says that there are two types of dalit movements one is the reformative another is the alternative so what are reformative movements he included bhakti movement in that as well as neo vedantic movement and sanskritization movement so reformative movements are such which do not ask for the hindu system to completely just go away they feel that certain reforms can be done from within so hinduism can be reformed through so these are the three examples he takes that the bhakti movement can be one way of reforming or neo vedantic sanskritization if you would have heard that gradually if they also learn the culture of say the little upper caste then the lower caste can also empower themselves on the other hand when we talk about alternative movement that says that no reform is possible we need to think something radical so what is radical they can go for conversion so here conversions of two kinds took place uh, many dalits converted themselves to buddhism ambedkar himself also converted to buddhism and he gave call to a large number of people but other than buddhism uh, many dalits converted into christianity also including pandita ramabai so uh, not just buddhism but christianity is also based on equality so in search of equality how to bring equality they thought of just uh, moving away from hinduism so getting into another religion will be something that will empower them so while reformative movements were something that focused on formless god that god has no form for example even dayanand saraswati uh, his organization arya samaj promoted vegetarianism that if they practice Uh, being vegetarianism then that will uh, in a way assimilate them into the hindu system 
but there were also this I have mentioned that competing ideologies were there. So, conversion to Christianity or Buddhism or any kind of a non-Hindu identity. So, people were searching for their non-Hindu identity. Here I have mentioned Sanskritization movements. So, numerous Sanskritization movements took place in 1920s and 30s where the practices of one was vegetarianism and another was thread ceremony. Maybe uh, we also call it Upnayan Sanskar or Yagyopavit Sanskar like the Brahmins do the thread ceremony. But later on even the other castes also started practicing thread ceremony. So, uh, practicing vegetarianism or thread ceremony these could be the ways to Sanskritize themselves. So, we have the examples that important leaders like Swami Thayakad in Kerala, uh, Muldas Vaishya in Gujarat, then Sundar Lai Sagar in UP, then Vinoba Raoji Pandey in Maharashtra. These were the leaders who led these Sanskritization movements in 1920s and 30s where they tried to assimilate the Dalits. They told them that they can also uh, in a way try to uh, have their lifestyle in such a way that they can be accommodated in the Hindu community. Here I have mentioned about uh, varied names of Dalit movement. This is again something that you should know that in different parts of India Dalit movements were named differently. For example, in Punjab they were called Adi Dharm movements. In Tamil Nadu they were named as Adi Dravid movement. In uh, UP they were called Adi Hindu movement, in Tamil Nadu it was named as self respect movement, in West Bengal it was called Namashudra movement and in Andhra Pradesh it was called Adi Andhra movement. So, these different names are something that you should know that in different parts they had different names and this route to conversion the, these were actually the route to conversion in order to get rid of untouchability as well as to improve their social and economic conditions. So, the Dalits were looking for these two things. One that they were looking for an identity which will give them more in a way uh, you can say social respect that they will have more self respect. So, be it converting themselves to Buddhism or Christianity that will help them they will be treated equally there. And secondly, they will have better chances of um, getting into occupations which will not be the conventional ones uh, because in the conventional occupation they have to do such things only which are to be done by their caste. So, that will give them a chance to improve their social and economic conditions. So, we come across uh, all these Dalit movements in different parts of India. Now, uh, let me quickly tell you about caste in the post independence India. So, in the post independence India it is the politics of reservation which is very important and I have mentioned this to you about three spheres education, employment and political representation that how the uh, reservation operates in India. Then second issue is that of dignity and self respect. So, about caste whenever it is about the Dalit identity it is the issue of dignity and self respect which is important. Third issue is that of formation of regional political parties on the basis of caste and in the later uh, slides we will discuss about some of those parties. Then OBC the other backward castes to EBC economically backward caste to EWS economically weaker sections. So, these terminology how uh, this changing terminology is in a way to accommodate different castes and uh, this is also linked basically with the politics of reservation. Because recently in order to give reservation to even the upper caste because it was being debated that not all the Brahmins are rich. So, in a way how does reservation help them? So, when this economically weaker sections uh, EWS quota came up then that was to uh, that would help the other communities also who are economically weaker. Then uh, caste identity is also linked with vote bank politics. Then this formation of BAMSIF took place in 1978 
BAMSIF is an organization, uh, you can, uh, its full form is Backward and Minority Communities Employees Federation. So this was an attempt to bring together different kinds of minority communities and those who consider themselves being backward. Then another formation was DS4. The full form of DS4 is Dalit Shoshit Samaj Sangharsh Samiti. So the Dalits of different uh, states, they decided to come together and uh, they thought of forming this DS4 and you can see that by 1980s also Dalits were trying to be much more united in order to have their uh, political weightage to be felt significantly. Here I have mentioned about caste based regional political parties. So in UP there are two major political parties which are based on caste. Uh, one is uh, by Kasi Ram uh, and Mayawati which is called BSP that is Bahujan Samajwadi party. Then uh, Mulayam Singh Yadav's party <coughs> Samajwadi party. So these two parties in UP are mostly considered as the caste based regional party. In Bihar, you have Lalu Yadav's uh, Rashtriya Janta Dal, RJD as a party. Then these parties tried to challenge the dominance of Congress party. So uh, since UP and Bihar, they are uh, one of the most populous uh, con uh, populous states of India and, and primarily the politics of uh, North India uh, has a major role in uh, the politics taking place in Bihar and UP. So formation of these uh, three political parties in a way it started shaping the national discourse also because eventually these parties uh, started playing important role in national politics as well. So uh, there, there were some more parties which came up and which are not so popular. For example, there was this Apna Dal by Sone Lal to unite the Kurmi community. Then there was this Rashtriya Lok Dal to unite the Jats in Western UP. Then so what happened is that we come across uh, Gatbandan and Mahagatbandan combinations to unite the Dalits because in, in states like Bihar, UP, these are the places where uh, in order to attract the Dalits toward themselves, uh, different kinds of political formations keep taking place. For example, in recent days, now there are new formations to unite the Nishads. Nishad is the community, the fishing community, those who are the fishermen or say even the boatsmen. So to have the Nishads, also the Malhars. Malhars are the boatman community and Nishad are the fishing community. Then the Mahadalits, then there are Kushwahas, so the flower selling community. So those erstwhile lower sections of the society, how to have them like how to assimilate them into the larger politics is something due to which this caste based regional political parties become very important to understand. Now let me quickly tell you about anti-reservation protests in 1990s. So why anti-reservation protests? So first we need to know about reservation because there was the, the reservation came up and then in order to oppose that there was this anti-reservation protest. So uh, let me first begin with this that there is something called Mandal Commission which was formed by the Morarji Desai government in 1979. So you can uh, imagine that it was the time of post emergency because you must be knowing that from 1975 to 77, two years long uh, emergency we had in India and that led to in a way um, the Congress dominance which was there for almost three decades in India um, which was even being called as the Congress system because most of the states also had the governments run by the Congress and of course the center also had the, uh, the Congress government. So that started crumbling down and uh, many states had this uh, non-Congress government as well as now the center also had a non-Congress government. So what Murarji Desai did was that he set up this uh, Mandal Commission in order to identify the socially and politically weaker sections of the society. Uh, he was told that there are different sections of the society 
other than the SCs and STs because so far we had reservations for the SCs and STs. So he was being told what happens to the, no, the non-SC STs who are also not that privileged. So how will you ensure reservation for them? So BP Mandal was the person who was the head of Mandal Commission and uh, it, this commission was set up in 1979 and it submitted its report in December 1980. So this report, this Mandal Commission suggested that there should be 27 percent reservation to the OBCs, the other backward caste. So that will lead to the total reservation will become then 49.5 percent reservation in government jobs as well as in uh, government educational institutions. So what happened is that though this uh, report was submitted in 1980 but nothing happened till 1990. So 10 years after submission of this report that this Mandal Commission uh, report was to be now implemented. So while the commission was set up by Murarji Desai, it was VP Singh as a Prime Minister who decided to implement this and he said that okay now we will have the implementation of this and the, uh, the OBC should be given reservation. So this led to widespread protests because those who will not be the beneficiaries, they were not happy about this reservation. So there was one instance where the reservation was to be given and then these protests which took place in order to oppose the reservation was called the anti-reservation protests of 1990s. And uh, here you can also see that uh, some people even say that it partly has a link with say Babri Masjid demolition because that took place in 1992. And uh, the year 1990 uh, is also the year when we were moving towards uh, liberalization, we were going to uh, have economic reforms. So in that sense when we talk about 1990s, uh, the year 1990 became in a way turning point because at the same time one this anti-reservation protests were taking place, then you now had those uh, regional political parties which were being influenced by the caste system, then the uh, Babri Masjid demolition was there and as well as the economic liberalization was something which was all set to happen. So this way you should try to understand that in India uh, when we became a democratic country, Indian constitution had such provisions that we adopted equality as a principle but at the same time caste kept influencing the politics in different ways and we could not overcome the issue of uh, uh, say untouchability uh, in its complete, you can say we could not stop untouchability fully. Uh, so it, it kept changing its form and that's why we feel that the Dalit uh, movement is also something it kept changing its form and things like uh, Dalit feminism came up or even Dalit capitalism is there, there is an emergence of capitalist class within uh, Dalits. So these are the issues that I wanted to mention about anti-reservation protest. First of all, why such an anti-reservation uh, protest was because now the general quota, those who will not be getting the reservation, they felt quite dissatisfied and they felt that it is going to cut their seats in a major way. So uh, this anti-reservation protest in a way again brought the issue of caste in a major way in India that on the one hand we should have actually aimed at uh, completely ending the reservation means the, the erstwhile 22.5 percent seats to the SCs and STs whether we should get rid of reservation or we should have more reservation because uh, those people who get the reservation then one generation after another if uh, many generations become the beneficiaries of, uh, uh, of the reservation system, then what happens is that it remains centered to just a few uh, groups of the society. So it is not that all the groups are equally benefited by reservation. Same is the case with the OBCs also. Do the OBCs also get the same kind of uh, uh, facility or not? So not all the other backward castes also get reservation. So these were some of the issues that I wanted to pose in front of you. 
So, here we uh, move on to the last slide of ours which is about conclusion of this. So, let me quickly first recap what we have done so far. Uh, so, I will just let me remind to you that we started from the days of social reforms as in how the caste reform movement started in the pre-independence days. Then we moved on to uh, the phase of Indian national movement that the caste reform movements were going on there. Then in the post-independence period, we talked about formation of numerous political parties which are based on the caste identity. Then I talked about the anti-reservation bill. So, you can now see that there has been a kind of uh, gradual shift in the issue of caste and uh, uh, caste as a homogeneous uh, identity is not something which uh, we can feel that the way it was understood in 20th century, uh, it is being understood in the same way now. Because thanks to the caste reform movements, now we have this understanding that caste will not be a way of discrimination when it will come to education or occupation. But yes, when it will come to reservation, that is going to affect that who will get uh, the benefit of reservation and who will not. So, earlier the understanding was that lower the caste will be lower the class. This was the kind of understanding which was the prevalent notion in, in the pre-independence India or the way Ambedkar wrote in his writings, but that is not the case now. Now it has changed quite a bit and no more it is necessary because it is possible that upper the caste and it can be lower the class or similarly it can be uh, lower the caste but they can be rich also. So we cannot say that necessarily caste and class will go hand in hand. Second point is that the reservation and mass education has gradually changed the or it has shaped the chain. So now you come across numerous uh, lower uh, castes who are in good uh, good jobs they have or they are good and uh, they have better prospects of education. So things as they were 100 years back, now we see there is a huge change thanks to the caste reform movements. Then there is this uh, emergence of Dalit middle class, there is also something like Dalit capitalism, there is Dalit feminism. So these are the different sections you can understand the different understandings within Dalits. So, uh, there is a kind of diversity of issues within Dalits. Then another notion is that of empowerment which has led to emergence of new categories, things like say Maha Dalits or Ati Pichhada Varg, economically weaker section. So, now there is this new system of different sections of quotas which has come up on the basis of caste. So, in India, uh, we have not come, uh, we have not overcome caste as such. What has happened is that the caste, class and gender conundrum, this relationship between caste and class has been changing gradually and no doubt about it that this changing interrelationship between them is also shaping the Indian polity and society. So, you come across new ways of political formations which are affected by caste. So, uh, with that we come to an end of this lecture and here I have mentioned some of the references and I would specially like uh, to ask you to read uh, the first, third and the fifth articles. So, so this Christoph Jaffelet's article caste and politics is something that you can read as well as Gopal Guru's article on Dalit women talk differently that will tell you about Dalit women. And uh, Ghanshyam Shah's mo uh, this article, Dalit Movements in Search of Identity. So, these three writings, uh, if you read, it will further uh, give you an understanding about the how does caste influence the Indian politics. So, I hope you enjoyed the lecture, and uh, with that, I bring this lecture to an end. Thank you.